All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Inside Writing presented by Gotham Writers. Uh, we are a, an online creative writing school offering writing classes to of all types and sizes. And you can find out more about us at GothamWriters.com. Moving into the show for today, uh, first, a reminder that at any point in the episode, you can submit your own questions for the Q&A portion of the show at the end of the show. So the sooner you get in those questions, the better. There's that big Q&A button on your Zoom dashboard where you can submit questions now, which some of you are already doing. So good job. Um, today is a special episode of Inside Writing. We're not going to be talking about a specific genre per se. We're, we're going to be talking about writing across different mediums, different genres, from YA to adult to screenwriting, graphic novels. Um, we're going. We're going to be talking about to two masters and doing just that. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into meeting our panelists. Uh, our first panelist, the New York Times bestselling author of Star Wars Phasma, along with a whole slew of other titles and accolades. Delilah Dawson. Hello, Delilah. Hi, thanks so much for having us. Absolutely, thanks for being here. Uh, and our second panelist, another New York Times bestselling author of the Star Wars novel Aftermath, along with, again, a whole slew of other titles and accolades himself, Chuck Wendig. Hi, Chuck. Well, hello. Aloha. Hi there. Hi. Hey, All right. So Hi, I want to. <laughs> I want to start the questioning. Uh, we, 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 well, especially as writers, you've all heard this phrase "stay in your lane," which I think writers, particularly beginning writers, uh, take to mean focusing on one form of writing and make that their thing. Chuck, when did it occur to you that you were not going to stay in your lane, that you were going to branch off into other forms of writing? Uh, you know, really early on, I took lessons from some of the writers that I read at the time. There was a. Um, an author, Robert McCammon, who wrote a lot of really great horror novels, um, sort of secondary or even tertiary to like Dean Koontz and Stephen King. Um, but they were best-selling novels and he did really well for himself. So uh, I remember reading all of his books and then his books started to change a little bit. They became a little more thrillery and a little, they started to shift genre. And uh, I know he wanted to change genres completely for a book he was going to do called Speaks the Nightbird. He wanted to tell kind of a detective story set in pre-revolutionary war America. And uh, his publishers were like, yeah, no, you can't do that. That's not, you're, you have your thing already and it's this horror thing and that's what you're contracted for. Uh, and he plunged into a depression because he was not able to get out of his contract. He had to either write more horror, which he didn't really want to do. Um, and so then at the same time, there was a, a Joe Lansdale, um, was a guy who started out from the very beginning writing, I mean, just weird, weird West and science fiction horror drive through drive in stuff and uh, straight up horror and detective books and funny things and comics. And, uh, you know, he right out of the gate didn't kind of get branded as one thing or another. And so I really liked that. And I, I aimed to emulate that going forward. And, and a lot of the other stuff that I ended up working in was just a thing of me kind of flailing wildly to try to figure out what I was able to do or what I was going to do. And Delilah, I saw you shaking your head as soon as I said stay in your lane. So I, I'm curious what your take is on this and when you started to break free of that or if you ever even thought that way. I mean, there's eight lanes on this divided highway and if you have big enough tires that can get over that little green swatch in the middle, you can go in any lane you want to. <laughs> um, I, I didn't set out to be a writer. I don't uh, have a writing degree. I didn't know from an early age I wanted to be a novelist or that it was even possible for me to write a novel. I thought that novelists were like nuns and surgeons where like you had been touched by God at an early age and you knew that this was your calling. And I, I had no idea what my calling was. I was a visual artist. Um, so I kind of didn't have these preconceived notions around publishing or, or people telling me that there were even lanes to be in at all. Um, so I wrote my first book when I was 31 and learned everything I know from the internet basically. Um, so I guess I knew I was going to be all over the place when my very first book idea, the first book I managed to squeeze out, um, which was terrible. Uh, it was a like magical realism women's fiction chiclet because I had no idea about a, a woman who went to Greece and accidentally slept with Zeus as, as women used to do. So I wrote this book. I couldn't even tell you what genre it was. And as I was querying it, I was like, oh, I got to write another book or I'm going to go insane. And the next book I started writing was a, a middle grade adventure with, you know, talking, talking, uh, tiny talking elves with mouse ears and uh, nobody was telling me what not to do because I'd never been steered in this direction. So I was like, yeah, I'll write this book. Um, then while I was querying that one, uh, I started writing a book about, um, based on a dream I had while watching Buffy that started with like a, a vampire in a, in a birch forest talking to me like Spike. And I was like, I want to hang out with him. So my first three books were like about as far away as you can get. So it's like, if, if nobody ever tells you there's lanes, you just drive wherever, you know, 
the nice path appears. Um, which my, my first agent, I remember being was like, we need to talk about branding. And I was like, ah, I don't care. Like, <laughs> I'm just, just going to run top speed this direction. Let me set this out from the beginning. This is just what I am and I'm going to write whatever obsesses me. And, and if you can sell it, that's great. And if not, some, hopefully somebody else will try, but she, she sold stuff all over the place. So yeah, it's, Maybe if you have like, if your first book takes off and like makes a bajillion dollars and hits number one on the list, they might want to put you in a lane. But I think especially in the mid list and in the indie world, you make your own lane. Yeah, I definitely feel like it's that scene in Better Off Dead where it's like, go down the mountain really fast this way. And if anything gets in your way, turn. And there's been a lot of turning because why not? <laughs> so Delilah, that... It, it, now that you are more established as rather than you were way back when you first started, you're still branching off into new lanes. Is that just... What's the impulse there? Is it just experimentation? Are you trying to reach new audiences or, or what makes you want to keep exploring? Um, I am definitely one of those uh, hell yes or no thank you people. Uh, if, if an idea comes to me and it obsesses me and I want to write it, I write it and then it's kind of up to other people to sell it or position it. Uh, and if I'm offered something or told to do something and I don't want to do it, um, the answer is no. I, I guess I've been offered some IP stuff, some you know properties uh, where you're writing in someone else's world, where I've been like, thank you so much for thinking of me, but like, this sounds like work. I don't want to do work. Uh, when, when writing is the right project for me, it feels like dancing. Um, it feels like ice skating. It's amazing. So I now can kind of feel the difference between, a, ooh, that's going to be like work and I'm going to dread it and I'm going to be stressed and I'm going to lose hair or that's going to be amazing. I'm going to wake up every morning glad to be alive. It's going to be so much fun. That's, that's it. Uh, but I also... Um, I guess writing for me is it's, it's, it's dancing, it's play. Um, and I am very fortunate in that my situation is not my, my whole family is not depending on me to be the sole breadwinner. So I have support where, you know, if, if I write a book that doesn't sell, we're not crashed. You know, my husband is, is still working. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it also, I think maybe that stay in your lane world or stick to your genres. You know, if you have a sure bet and you're keeping your family alive, you keep driving in that lane as long as you can keep your family alive. Uh, so it kind of has to do with, with your personal needs, your financial needs, your emotional needs. And, and Chuck, was, is it the same for you? Is it just wherever project feels right, that's where you end up going? Yeah, more or less. And it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm a selfish monster. I, I, uh, I'm just really kind of in this to be like, you know, I, I do want to have fun and I want to, um, you know, very early on, I tried writing, you know, novels. I think I had five trunk novels and I, I you know I mean they're like trunk novels in the truest sense like if you release them from the trunk they will haunt the land and like cause a poltergeist type situation they were that bad and uh they were all versions of books where I was like chasing you know I was either chasing the market or I was chasing what I thought other writers sounded like uh I was constantly doing this thing where I wasn't really writing the books I wanted to write and then when I finally figured that out and I kind of hit bottom and I wrote the book that I wanted to write and I threw a bunch of you know, other conventions, things you weren't supposed to do. I'm like, well, I'm going to put them in there. I'm going to have a start with a character staring at themselves in the mirror. Ha ha ha. I can't do that. I'm doing it. And, uh, I, you know, it was a profane book in sort of, uh, uh in, in present tense, like all these things where I was like, this is the book I want to write. And, uh, that was the book that sold. And so, uh, I sort of viewed that as going forward as not just a, a value add to me as being sort of, again, the selfish monster, uh, aforementioned, but that I think I'm probably writing better when I'm writing things that speak to me in some way or that speak about me or, you know, uh, that, that take all of the things that I, I am and have put inside myself and sort of glom them onto the page. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I mean, of course you're a selfish monster, but I think that there's, <laughs> of course. there's an alchemy to what we do. The connection of, of your skills and talent in the moment with an idea that's, it's, it's like tapping down to that third rail of the subway that makes it go. Yeah. That's right. Where, yeah. Anytime I've tried to write to try to beat a trend or write yeah. to the uh, write to the trends or the industry, it's the book has fallen flat. It's like it doesn't have the the heart and the guts. It's like you can make a Frankenstein, but if that lightning doesn't strike, it's just a corpse. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be a Frankenstein you want to you want to dance with. You know, you got yeah. really, to really want the Frankenstein monster. And it seems like those those books where you're like, screw it, I'm just doing the thing are the ones that seem to go someplace. Yeah. Yeah. And they have a lot, you know, those books are the ones you're writing out of passion, out of anxiety, out of like, again, all of the things. Out of need. You, uh, yeah. Out of need. 
you know, people, writers in particular, sometimes obsess about originality in fiction, this idea that they can write like the perfect idea and it's a unique, special, precious idea. Uh, and it's like, first of all, ideas are not gems, they're costume jewelry. So it's all about how you wear them. Um, but then, you know, you bring these theoretically unoriginal ideas to the page, but if you let that story be your own and you put all yourself into it, you're the original thing that, you know, counts. You're the one original thing you get to have is you. Uh, nobody else is you and nobody else is going to bring that story to the page the way you're going to bring it to the page. And so I think it's valuable to seize that and not run away from it. I used to think that there was a perfect idea. And then I realized that you can take literally any idea anywhere. And if you put the right oomph on it and the right fertilizer and you tend it every day, that that's, that's the one that's going to run. Yep. I have to say the metaphor game is strong today. I like the, it has to be a Frankenstein you want to dance with. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's the you, name of our, our joint memoir. <laughs> you, you touched on something I want to get into. And this is what one of the things I'm most curious about as well. When it, when it comes to writing across genres uh, from young adult to, to graphic novels, how do you maintain your own original writing voice? Chuck, let's start with you. Do you, do you mold your voice to fit different areas? Uh, I mean, I don't really mold the voice in the sense of, um, to frame it differently, like I view my work as being under a single genre, which is the me genre, uh, which again, sounds really selfish and sort of narcissistic. And I don't mean it to be. I just mean like, I want every book to feel like I wrote it. And that's the sort of the, the, the point of like, I want it to not only for me be the book that I'm writing and care about and um, that, that feels like the book I needed to write. Uh, and also for if I have anything resembling an audience, a unified audience, I want them to come to the table and understand and recognize that that's a book I've written and feel good about that. Um, and so, you know, whether, whatever you feel about auteur theory or whatever, like, you know, all of those things that make a book mine, I, I want them in there. Um, but I mean, obviously I, I adjust language according to Jami, a thriller pacing is very different from something a little more epic and ponderous and certainly middle grade and young adult have their own kind of tones and pep. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily about uh, modifying voice entirely, but a lot about modifying pacing and a lot about modifying the shape of the prose on the page really matters. Mm -hmm. And Delilah, as someone who's written across adult, young adult, middle grade, do you find yourself having to alter anything other than what Chuck has already mentioned whenever you venture into a new age of your audience? Well, I think that this is the question of, of voice and tone and pacing and matching it to the book and the genre um, is one of those things. Uh, it's kind of like swimming where you don't know how to do it until you do and you're just floundering until you do. I think for a lot of writers, our first books either were mimicking an author or a style that we really like, or we're testing something, or we're going, oh, I don't like the route everyone else is going, I'm going to be the first person to do this. So a lot of our first books are kind of floundering, trying to find our voice. Mm -hmm. And that the more you write, the more you build that voice. And if you need to use the training wheels of copying a famous author or writing fanfic with someone else's characters, like whatever, whatever training wheels you need to be able to get on a bike on your own is totally fine. And then yeah. as you get more and more miles under you, you will find your style and, and your voice and gain that skill of being able to more accurately match it uh, to what you're currently writing. Yeah, you nail it when you say find your voice. That's the, it's like, it's one of those things where you spend so long chasing some idea of a voice and you realize it was kind of just, it sounds, so, it sounds so like twee, but it was in you all along. It was your voice. You heard it. It's like, it's a thing that's been inside your head. Like, I mean... <laughs> I hear it. <laughs> so along those lines, I want to, I want to transition into star Wars now, which will take up a, a, a good amount of time here. Yeah. We'll be four um, hours. I get it. It's okay. <laughs> Buckle up everybody. <laughs> You've both done a lot of work in the star Wars universe and, and speaking to the point of incorporating your writing style into like for most writers, it's just, you're creating with a blank canvas, but when you're writing into a universe that already exists, I imagine you do have to alter your approach a bit. So Delilah, I want to start with you. What, what was it like, writing into a pre-existing universe? Did it make the approach easier because you didn't have to create as much? Well, I've written in uh, several properties before Star Wars. You don't, most people don't get Star Wars off the gate. That's, mm -hmm. that's the Golden Apple project. So you generally build up your voice in other uh, you know, properties and play on their playgrounds as you learn the roles. Um, but the cool thing about Star Wars books is that they're choosing you for your voice. They don't want it to be a cookie cutter book. They don't want me to write like Christy Golden um, they don't want, you know, 
Chuck to write like Jason Fry, like we just all write different books. So they tend to very carefully, the editors there, it's, it's never a mistake, it's the person that they match to the book and what they want to accomplish with that book. Um, so I've seen a lot of support from them in, you know, telling a story that feels very me within the framework of the characters and timeline we're given, what we want to accomplish, what we can and can't do. But at no point have they ever, you know, said, tone down your voice, or tone down yourself. Um, you know, it's more like, though, you can't use that ship because the quad drive yards were closed for those three years during the war. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's also, um, you know, writing for Star Wars, it's not that they call you today and they say, write us a book about Vader and you just write a 100,000 page book and throw it at them. And they're like, oh, this is surprising. Like you, you start with knowing the parameters, knowing what they need to accomplish. You pitch them ideas. They choose one, massage it, Frankenstein it again. You know, then you do a longer outline and, you know, you finally have the 20 page outline and then that gets okayed with like, there's so many people who are, have to have buy-in on this and who need their objectives met. And there are so many, um, you know, nets under this trapeze that nothing that happens in a Star Wars book uh, is a, a surprise or an accident. So Chuck, what about your experience with, with, especially with Aftermath, but with all the stuff you've, you've done in that universe as well? I, I, this is all new to me and I, I assume to a lot of our listeners as well. So when they, they reach out and they, they approach you about this story and then you present your own story to them? Yeah, my case, I mean, and it's true, I think in writing in general, uh, but writing IP, it can also be true um, that we all have our own weird way in. Like we all, you know, we, we all make a weird map that only works for us and only we know how to follow, follow it. So uh, I tweeted about wanting to write Star Wars, which is not normally how you get jobs so but I, I did it just as on a lark and then multiple sort of people uh, like the aforementioned Jason Fry and Gary would have um, sort of moved that into the spaces it needed to be and next thing I know I was meeting with the Del Rey editors at New York Comic Con and um, uh, at the time uh, the editor said well I've read uh, some of your books and I said well then this was a good meeting thanks for thanks for considering me but I understand that the answer is no and she said no no I read the good ones and I said well that's okay that's good that helps um, but she read my young adult books which were um sort of a John Steinbeck riff on Star Wars. So they, you know, said, well, we want you to do it. We need a book very quickly. So, uh, you know, with the movies coming out in a year and uh, I did this, you know, I did the thing. I did the uh, proposal and a synopsis for the first book and then a theoretical two more books. And uh, they, they did hire me and they were, I originally had three months to write the first draft. Uh, and then they moved up the publishing date by two months uh, which sounded cool until she's also like, that moves your deadline up by two months. <laughs> I was like, so three minus two is, I'm not really a math guy, but that, does, that doesn't sound like good. So I had a month to write the first draft of the first book. So that was a, um, a hardcore situation. Thankfully, I'd written, uh, or just built my writing shit at that time. And so I was able to sort of uh, go into exile in the shed and, and write a Star Wars book. But yeah, I, you know, in terms of style, and they, they do encourage... Um, that bringing that style to the table still, I felt like I was still able to tell the story I wanted to tell. In fact, a lot of the restrictions, especially with that novel that they put in place, helped me tell the story I wanted to tell because it didn't require I lean on a lot of pre-existing characters and narratives. It was kind of a, like, you have to be in this time frame and you can't use these characters, so go. Uh, and that was a fun place to be. I heard some people um, ask if, if writing for IP is like being put in a box and I just always want to say to him, like, yeah, imagine that box is a room and it's a room full of all of your favorite toys. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, it's a Star <laughs> Wars box. Let's be clear. Yeah. To be in. And, yeah. and the, the parameters <laughs> they give you make you so creative uh, in, in how you solve those problems. It's, it's just a very organic process. And it's, it's really exciting. But I never felt like, you know, oh, darn, you know, I can't do anything. You know, yeah. I can't ever it, use Bothans. Like, you're just it, like, oh, there's so many toys. And then when it's a to toy the, box. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's the best exact, a metaphor. Perfect. And then when you get to like a little block, and you're like, oh, what do I do? They're like, ah, make up a planet. <laughs> make up an alien race. It's <laughs> I know when you do that, you're like, wait, I'm allowed to just make up things? And you're like, yes. I'm a god now. Yeah. Oh, my god. <laughs> so, Delilah, you've mentioned it a few times. What is IP in the simplest terms? Sure. So IP stands for intellectual property. It's anything that someone else owns. So that goes from Star Wars, Star Trek, Alien versus Predator, DC, Marvel, all the way down to like, I think Hugh Howey had people writing in his wool world. Uh, so there, are, you know, and I know that um, like Charlene Harris invited people into an anthology where they could write true blood stories. So it's anything that someone else owns the rights to and that you're kind of beholden to them for, for the rules. I mean, there, you, technically anything we write is IP. Realistically, it's sure. just we refer when we say IP, we usually mean licensed 
material. Actually, someone else owns it and we're getting to play in it. But I mean, technically, yeah, our work is our intellectual property um, as well. Just we own it. No one else is writing it. It's just a box of one. <laughs> so, Which I'm, like I said, a box of wine. And actually, that's <laughs> right well, that would be that good, too. too. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> So I don't usually like to ask, how does it feel questions, but I have to, because I, I have to know, Chuck, what it feels like to have contributed to the Star Wars universe. Uh, cool, really cool. Uh, like, I mean, I, you know, I, I pickled myself in the Star Wars universe for the last 40 years. So um, to sort of be able to wring out that sponge and just to sort of own a, like a tiny little piece of real estate was wonderful. And I get, some people ask me questions where they're like, oh, well, you know, you're, Aftermath uh, started a new canon and it, some, depending on how they ask it, sometimes they're like, Aftermath destroyed the old canon, how dare you? Um, but they're like, so aren't you going to be mad when they do that to you? And I was like, no, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't view this stuff as like rigorously historical because it's all just made up stuff. It, it, just the fact that I got to play in it at all was uh, as much of a delight as it could have been. Mm -hmm. And Delilah, you've likened it to a toy chest. So I, I assume it's pretty fun for you as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's like Chuck, like we were, Star Wars has been a part of my life from the moment that I have memories pretty much. So it's, it's in my blood and um, it's, it's my world. Like I, there's a there's baby Yoda mask right behind me right now that I put out a <laughs> space before we started to record so I could look serious. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really neat. And it is, I mean, uh, so my very first uh, Star Wars panel at a con was at Dragon Con. And it was right after I'd been tapped to write uh, The Perfect Weapon which was a novella that came out. Um, it was like the first thing that came out after The Force Awakens. And this guy was like, you know, they're waiting in line to ask questions and everything is for Zahn and Stackpole and Anderson. And then I get finally like, this question is for Miss Dawson. And I'm like, oh, and he said, how does it feel to be the only writer up there who doesn't have a character with an action figure? And I was like, it feels awesome because I write Star Wars. <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> <it's just> like, <laughs> You can't take it away from me. It's it's out there and we've contributed and we've Chuck and I have put each other in our books. So we're mm -hmm. both canon now too. Yeah, we're both canon. You can't take us away. That's mm -mm. <laughs> so as much as I don't want to, I now have to move on from Star Wars uh, and, and talk about other things. Uh, so Chuck, I want to start with you on this one. Uh, you know, with, with exploring so many different mediums, was there any transition that was harder than all the rest? Like was writing YA like the hard, or, or was there any particular genre or age group that you found harder than the rest no i didn't find um i didn't find switching genres to be tricky because i'm still moving into genres where i'm either you know i'm excited and i'm reading them and i kind of want to be in those spaces it's not something i'm really forced to do i think the only time there was ever any you know sense of rough transition was when i left because i started out writing pen and paper games mm -hmm. um and when i had to leave freelance to write novels um, that was a rough year because it, it was rough year financially because I was literally setting aside my one income stream to leap out of a plane and hope I could construct the parachute on the way down and make another income stream. And, um, you know, it's also fundamentally a very different experience writing games, which is kind of like I'm creating a toolbox for other people's stories and then to have the ego to tell your own story in the novel form. Um, they're very different things. And then, um, I transitioned into screenwriting and that was a whole different oxygen shift. So usually transitioning from medium to medium is where I find that sort of sharp, uh, sharp shock. Um, but genre to genre, I, again, I'm always trying to keep telling the stories that I want to tell just in a different framework. And I usually, I don't, I hesitate to say it's easy, but I don't find it jarring. Mm -hmm. Delilah, is it the same for you? Yeah, my, my steepest hill was going from novels into comics. Uh, my first comic script, you know, was like, 70 pages long for a 22 page comic. Mine too. <laughs> you know, I, there were 900 words on every page and 14 uh, panels because we get so used to saying everything we want to say. And then, you know, you get that first edit letter and you go, oh, oops. And then I read a bunch of scripts on the comics archive and I, you know, started the script from the, the floor up. It was, it was like, it broke me down and, and pulled me back up. And I'm so grateful for my editors having the patience for it. But then once you you get that in your blood, you know, you do that just as naturally as books. But I think it's, if you're, if you're reading these things constantly, um, you know, you can, you can kind of get into that headspace and internalize, you know, the, if not rules, then what the audience expects, you know, anybody who's trying to write a romance is not going to give you a happily ever after a happily for now is going to have trouble selling that. And, you know, anybody who's writing YA from a 
distant third person perspective that doesn't focus on guttural feelings is going to have a difficult time. So as long as you're, you know, you have read and are currently reading uh, deeply in what you're writing. Um, and in the last five years, like you can't read the outsiders and be like, I'm going to write the new YA. Like, no, dude, you got to read what's on the list right now yeah. uh, to see what's going on. So yeah, you just got to stay tuned in. Yeah. The comics thing is interesting because they don't, like no one knows how to write a comic script. And I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean, but it's just the wild west. Like whereas the screen screenplays have like a pretty concise set of rules, even down to margin sizes and how everything is sort of framed and the software tends to format it exactly for you. And then, you know, I remember getting hired to do comics and they're like, well, here's a bunch of scripts. You can read these and figure it out. And I read them and like, there was not a single stylistic commonality between them. Some of them were these huge wordy talky things some of them were conversations with an artist. Some of them didn't seem to acknowledge an artist at all. Some of them were like really spare, almost screenplay like, very tight, you know, uh, minimal description, just dialogue. Uh, it was f fascinating. So it didn't help at first because it's like, how do you do this? Like, well, your own way, figure it out. And it's like, uh, uh oh. Yeah, that, that actually covered, I was going to ask what the transition was like from writing prose to writing script, but you both covered that already. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, I also, I wanted to find out whenever you get your ideas, how do you decide which medium you're going to funnel it into? Like what makes you think this is a YA novel or this is a, a comic book? What, what gives you that lane of which one you're going to choose for that project? Chuck, let's start with you. Um, usually the idea is sort of pre-baked into where the format. I mean, you know, if you're writing YA, you're, I mean, you have a pretty good sense that it's like a, the protagonist is a teenager with that is, is relevant to teen issues um, in some capacity or another, emotionally or sociologically, whatever. Um, so it, it feels like it's kind of shown itself already, like it's revealed itself to be. I mean, sometimes a book or something will take its own weird form. I mean, Wanderers, in fact, most of my books I, I essentially wrote as horror, like I, in my heart, they're horror novels. Um, but a lot of the genres are very different, whether it's young adult or um, science fiction. Wanderers is often build as science fiction, but, uh, you know, it was, and then it was nominated for a Stoker award on the horror side. So, um, I, you know, and I don't, I try not to worry about that either because genre is just a thing we made up. It's not really, um, I mean, it has certain expectations and certain genres have more expectations than others, but, uh, I like to sort of smash them together in, in the, in the toy box, just like now you kiss horror and <laughs> sci-fi. What happens now? Is the same for you, Delilah, when it comes to where your ideas funnel into in terms of medium? Yeah, I feel like the, it's like Chuck said, the bottom line is that genre is the shelf at the bookstore that they put your book on. And it may not be your job to figure out which shelf that is, that you write the book that, that speaks to your soul and you, you know, hork it up and then you let someone else decide where they think it would go best. Um, but in regards to feeling your way into the conventions of genre, so that you, know, you don't have to edit for seven years. Um, I see every book idea. Um, so I see this, this triangle. And on one side, at the top is character, and on one side is world building, and on the other is hook. So every, every story idea either comes as, oh my God, this character, I have to write them. And then my job is to find the world that would have created them and that would uniquely challenge them and the hook that would be the third, the third leg there of in a world win this person. And then it's, it's the same for the other things. If I get the world first, which has happened before, then I have to figure out which character would have the hardest time in this world so I can torture them and what hook would torture them uniquely in this world. And then if I have the hook first, those two things. So I think whatever idea you have is probably going to be one of those legs, that triangle. And, you know, like if you get a world first, you'll have more lassitude to decide, oh, well, is, is my protagonist eight or 18 or 48? Um, whereas if you get a character first, you're generally in today's world, uh, pretty nailed down because this is not the wild eighties where you can, you know, write a horror novel about a 12 year old and call it adult. Uh, we, we know what it is. Um, so yeah, you just got to kind of put those little three pieces together and, and see where it fits and what feels right. I mean, it's, I used to think of it like uh, crossing lily pads in a pond where you kind of reach out and touch here and touch here and see what feels stable as you pick your way across. Uh, and of course, as you write more books, you can make a more solid path. But at first, I felt very like, well, how about this? And so I'd write the first paragraph and be like, oh, that doesn't feel right. So I'd erase it and I'd start again with a different point of view or a different voiciness. And, you know, just kind of try and feel. It's like, it's like cooking. You got to taste constantly. Constantly. So that, that segues perfectly into what my next question was going to be, which is 
when, when you're going and looking like when you want an idea, where do you, do you just consume other meat? You just read stuff. Do you, where do you go to look for ideas? Delilah. Um, I mean, ideas, I have not ever had a, a desert of ideas since I started writing, I guess, uh, you know, it's, you pay attention to the world. I feel like when I am having trouble and an idea isn't coming, I need to get super bored where you just go sit on the couch without a phone or a screen and you just stare out the window and see what you get. Um, I'll get lost on, I used to get lost on Tumblr um, or, or Instagram where you'll see interesting visual things. Um, I have to go for walks. If I get near water, it's great for me to be near, um, especially running water, like a lake or a lake isn't running water, you know, a river or an ocean, something that's moving a Creek. Like, so these are these little things. Uh, but when I was first starting out, I would write down every idea I had um, in a journal and I would keep it by my bedside. So of course, some of them were like, unicorn toothpaste, ha ha. And you'd be like, I don't know what that means. Um, but then whenever I needed a project and was hungry to do the work and didn't have an idea, I could go dig it up and look through there for an idea. Um, these days it's, it's, I'm pretty jam packed and I, there's ideas fighting for the four that I'm like, you've got to wait six months. We're booked, sir. Back up. <laughs> Chuck, is it pretty similar for you? Yeah. I, um, I always say that people are so fond of asking writers, where do they get their ideas? And I say the real question is how do you make them stop? Uh, cause it's constant. Like it's just a, it's just a, I, you know, a stupid, they're, they're constantly like, nope, that's it. I just can't turn them off. And as we're writing, you know, we're hunkering down on the thing we're writing, you know, I, you would like to trying to like get away from it. Um, so I, you know, I, I stopped writing them down also. I, I willfully stopped writing them down um, with the idea that they're going to commit sort of like idea Thunderdome inside my head. <laughs> like two ideas enters, one emerges. And whoever, if one keeps coming back, Wanderers is like that. Wanderers lived with me for like four years. And just the idea, there's no story. Uh, and it's again why I say ideas are just sort of junk. They're not, they're nothing without other things sort of grafted onto them. Um, you know, like story and character, who knew? So uh, it, it just haunted me for four years, the idea of people sleepwalking, waking up one by one and going somewhere. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know where they were going. Uh, and without those things, I didn't have a reason to write it. Um, but, you know, the world lined up and the, sometimes the brownies just need time in the oven to, to keep baking. Again, the metaphor game is so strong here. Um, now so I'm, I'm hungry, so there's that. <laughs> this is also a big part. Like, both of our voice is very metaphor-based. <laughs> I do like metaphors. Okay. <laughs> so I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the business side of writing across mediums. Uh, Delilah, you've touched on this already about working with an agent. So I want to start with talking about how do you find the right agent whenever you know you want to write across mediums when so many agents have one or, or a collection of things if you don't fit into that thing? How do you find agents that will work with you across different mediums? Yeah, I thought about this a lot the first time I queried because like I said, I already had two very far apart things and like humorous chiclet romance and uh, child adventure talking rat. So um, when I was on agent tracker and no, agent tracker and query, tr query tracker and agent query, that's it. Um, you know, I would search for the, the main book that I was querying. Then when it would list all of the other um, genres, if they didn't represent the next two ideas I had in the queue, I didn't put them on my list. So I needed someone who represented, you know, romance, chiclet, middle grade. And then I had this kind of idea of percolating for, you know, a romance. And so I had to look for all of those. So I would make a very extensive Excel list and I would list in there all of the genres that they covered to make sure that they were kind of in there. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think I came up with like 90 plus agents and that was in 2010. Mm -hmm. So there, there were plenty out there, but yeah, if you think you're going to be writing multiple genres, you do not want to go with, you know, someone who literally only does YA. Um, I had two agents offer on my first, well, my second book, the first one was hot garbage. Um, but one of the agents, I love her, like I'm friends with her on Twitter and Instagram, and she's an incredible agent. And at the time, she only, she only did middle grade and YA. So it was like, I love you, but this next book I've got, I've really got to write this vampire dude, and it is not YA. <laughs> So I unfortunately had to, you know, turn down that kind offer. But yeah, it's, it's better to know now than in two years, have an agent you love and be like, oh, I wrote horror and you don't represent it. I don't know what to do. And Chuck, what about you? What was your experience like in finding an agent? Uh, yeah, I sought an agent who uh, was multifarious in that way. And um, I, you know, it's sort of one of those unusual experiences where 
I mean, and some of this comes down to also how I write and a lot of it comes down to a gut check thing. I mean, obviously I went to that same experience of just looking for an agent who could do multiple things. But um, when I started to get interest from different agents, um, the agent that I uh, submitted to, uh, who remains my agent today, Stacia, she, um, she was new at the time. And uh, so she wasn't, you know, didn't know exactly. I mean, she, I knew she was going to do multiple genres, but her, her genres were not all, you know, all of them. It wasn't just like a wide open field. She didn't list YA or anything, but at the time I didn't know I wanted to write YA. And um, so when I finally, you know, got her offer of representation, you were like, the wise thing to do is you're supposed to go to the other people who have your manuscript and be like, Hey, just what did you know? I've been offered representation, but here's your, you have like a period of time to, and I was just like two middle fingers. I'm like, I did it. And I was like, I'm out. Uh, and it, I mean, it wasn't simply because I was like, whew, this is done. But I like, I felt, you know, she and I had talked about editing the book and figuring out what kinds of changes she thought were necessary and how she would, you know, put the book out there. And it just really synced up. And I also knew because she was a newer editor or a newer agent that she would have time for me because I'd already been hearing some stories of people who picked these like kind of big gun agents, but because they were not yet big gun writers, it took a long time to get even their agent on the phone. Uh, and my agent probably doesn't like hearing from me because I talk to her fairly constantly. We're, we're in near constant communication. So um, we email a lot. <laughs> we email a lot. Yeah, Station and I have the same agent now. So we, we totally, we email a lot. And uh, so it was, I just knew it was a good fit. And I mean, obviously I'm glad I made that choice. Uh, I feel maybe bad for the people who I wasn't as <laughs> polite to. I mean, I wasn't mean about it. I wasn't a jerk about it, but I was just like, well, no, I, I found my agent. Thank you very much. Like I, you know, wrote a polite disentanglement email but um uh yeah so it was if some of it comes down to that strategy of finding you know what they represent but also comes down to talking to them about it when you actually start to zero in on somebody try to get their ideas about that you know um, feel them out be very frank about what you want to do and the options you may want to take and and paths you may want to choose and uh we sort of built it as we went uh, you know young adult was not a thing she did uh, comics was not a thing she did. And so these were things that like... Well, now middle grade was not her thing. Middle grade was, was not a thing. Now we're, like, we've both done time. that, yeah. She had exactly. to do it. She, had, she has to. She can't help it. We're trapping her. Mostly it's just a game. We're just like a... It's like a game of like saw. Like we've trapped her in a room and we're like, and now open the box. It's middle grade. Now you have to sell this. Ha ha ha. We oh, died. We all died. Yeah, we died. This is her hell actually. <laughs> we're just here to taunt her forever. My geriatric so, space opera. Next. <laughs> is that something, Chuck, is that something you would point out in the query that you want to write in all these different genres or would you just focus on the one book at a time? I focused on the book because that was the prevailing advice. And I, uh, I think that's still the good advice. I think you're less useful talking about the breadth and depth of your intended career and more trying to sell a book. You're trying to really like be like this book is this book. And then a little bit about like, Hey, I'm me and this is what I'd like, but mm -hmm. the book is the thing you're trying to sell. Um, now that being said, I think in conversations with the agent, uh, the there's the call, the call. Yeah. When you start to have those deeper cuts, you need to have a clearer picture that both you have a, a sense of your career, uh, not just like, well, here's a book. I don't know what now that, I mean, that's okay, but, um, it's good to just have some sense of that. Like, you know, I always try to have like a, one to five to 10 year plan, like three different sort of tracks of theoretical ideas. And as you get into that 10 year, you know, viewpoint, it gets real hazy, but like, I have a vision of it. Like I could be, it could be the wasteland and I could be writing troubadour novels for mutants. I don't know. Like there's so many options. So, um, but to have those discussions with them and also to make sure that they're comfortable with the kind of writer you envision yourself to be going forward. Cause otherwise that's going to be a real uncomfortable fit uh, if it doesn't line up. Yeah, you definitely want to be honest from the start. Like, this is not a time to be to be coy with an agent or be like, oh, we'll talk about that later. Like, during the call, you need to establish this because if they can't do what you need, you should not choose them out of necessity. Like, if one legit agent will give you an offer, others will too. But yeah. you don't want to shackle yourself to a bad fit just so you can be out of the hell of querying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Delilah, when it came to finding other, like, especially getting into stuff like Star Wars or Hellboy or stuff, is that something where you just go to your agent and you say, I would love to do this. Can you line this up for me? Or how does that work? I mean, you, you let your agent know what you're into, I guess. Um, but the vast majority of these, these IP companies, you don't go to them, they come to you. Um, so, you know, my first IP was a Shadow Man novella for Kindle Worlds when they were, you know, conscripting 
kind of medalist authors to write for Kindle Worlds to legitimize it. I got to write a Shadow Man novella, which was awesome. Um, so it's like, you've got to, generally you start small, lots of people start with like a story and an anthology here or there where you can get it. Um, but you know, after my friend Chuck tweeted that he wanted to write Star Wars, I also tweeted that I wanted to write Star Wars. I was not immediately offered a book. Um, so like, I, I think I asked Chuck and a couple of my other friends who had written Star Wars, like, Hey, if you're ever around a Star Wars editor and they're like, Oh, if only I knew a woman who could write a book. Like, and I asked my agent to send them some of my books that were applicable and, you know, you can, you can kind of put your name out there. You, you talk to people, um, you know, like I think the Hellboy came from, you know, I, I got to do a signing at Dragon Con where I was between Chris Golden and Jonathan Mayberry, who are like two of the kings of IP anthologies. So that's not a position that you can seek to be in. I just so happened to sign up to have a slot with the HWA and that's what I got to do. So a lot of the networking that you see happening is not somebody being like, I'm going to write this and I'm going to be in the, in the bar with this editor and we're going to talk about it. It's like, you see a spot, you meet someone, you're always gracious, you develop having a really good attitude that you're fast to work with, that you're not a diva, that you can turn out a story quick, you know, and you, you talk to people and, you know, your name starts to get out there. Um, so yeah, I mean, like my, my agent always knows what I'm up for. And she's like, oh, I heard so-and-so talk about this. You interested? And I'm like, heck yeah, I am. Or I'm like, oh, not quite, but you know, my friend so-and-so. Um, and a lot of us talk too, like, you know, I've, I've had things where I was offered an IP and it didn't feel right for me. And I was like, oh, you should talk to my friend so-and-so. And like, then they got the, the job. So it's, when we talk about networking, a lot of it is just, it's, it's complete, uh, complete roll of the dice, plus just being a nice person that people want to work with. Yeah, I always find that, you know, any writers who sort of view other writers or agents or editors or networking in general as kind of a ladder, um, I find you can kind of feel it and it doesn't usually work. Um, the way so many of these things happen is really pretty just random. And it's just, like I said, it's a lot of flailing, like happy, you know, loving flailing. Like, I'm just, I don't know, I'm here. Like, I don't know what's happening. And I'm doing this and I'm talking to this person. And like, someone says, you should meet this person. You're like, cool, I will. And you just try to be nice. And inevitably things about, you know, what you like and what you're into and what they write and who they are, it all comes up and you, you never know. Sometimes things have, you know, something has grown out of a seed that got planted three years before at a con when you had drinks together. You know what I mean? Uh, not that it always need, needs to necessitate around alcohol. I just mean like sometimes you just hang out and talk to people and that's that conversation yields fruit way down the line. And so that's nice. Yeah. But in general, if you are someone who wants to write IP, the very best thing you can do is to have five to 10 years of a solid career as a traditionally published author underneath you with a sterling reputation for being fast nice, helpful, mm. you know, when you get edits, you don't, you don't flip a table and scream like, but that's, yeah. that's the best thing you can do. Nobody just comes to you and is like, I heard from the Dragon Con elevator that you're the number one Star Wars fan. Want to write a book? Cause you have to <laughs> be proven that you can write a yeah. hundred thousand words in 40 days is, yeah. and they, you can't prove that you can do that unless you've done that multiple times. And I, I think there's um, value noting, you know, as Delilah's kind of mentioned, like you should do this because you really like it. Uh, IP in particular is a thing that you should do only if you really like are geeked about the thing, like you're a fan. And so, I don't mean that's, I don't mean the fandom is what gives you cred. Uh, obviously again, you're looking at someone who should have a lot of writing ability and a career behind them before you even try to crack that nut. But, uh, IP is relatively thankless, uh, in the sense that it's, there's almost no royalties. If there are royalties, they're often minimal. You own nothing. Um, the pay is depending, it might be at the low to middle end of what you would get for an original book. Um, and it's not something you can ever monetize further. I mean, within some limitation, again, some royalties, depending on the, the story world of the license owner. Um, sometimes if it gets made into a movie or TV show or something, or a character gets moved, some of them like Marvel or something like that will have some mechanisms of payment, although Star Wars really doesn't. Um, so it's the Star Wars contract is a, a like a, a demon's contract. <laughs> it's not something you would really want to sign unless you, you really cannot like negotiate Star Wars. With that thing. You, you can't negotiate. negotiate. It does I not mean, there's, for yeah, you. there's literally stuff in the contract that's like, we could take this book, take your name off of it and publish it and not pay you. And you're like, okay. Like, I mean, I know they're not going to because that's a public relations nightmare, but they could. And you they sign that contract. They could make it into a movie and you would get zero dollars and possibly zero not dollars. even a credit unless they felt nice. Yeah. So you do it because you like it, not because it's a thing that's really 
a value add for your career. It's ultimately kind of like a, I mean, it'll pay you. It's not like it's free, but it's, you know, it, it, something like Blackbird's, my first book is constantly getting foreign sales, film, TV, right? It's never been made to a film or TV show and it probably never will, but inevitably it just sort of little translations or audio royalties or this. And it's just kind of a slow, steady burble of, of income. Um, and that's how you kind of survive. Whereas IP will not give you that unless you're constantly refreshing it and just writing new stuff. Have um, to feed the beast. You have to feed the beast. So again, I, you know, I always encourage people who come up and be like, I want to write licensed work. And it's like, do you want to write licensed work because it's licensed work? Because it's, it has no glory to it. Um, you do it because you're like, if you write Hellboy, it's because Hellboy is awesome. And you're like, well, I would like to just, I want, I want that feather in my cap. It's kind of a cool thing. I have a story idea. Um, and then you, you approach your agent or, or find the editors or whoever. So I have so many more questions, but I have to get into audience questions now. Uh, so I want to start, uh, Delilah, let's hear from you first on this one. How, how has experimenting with genre and, and across mediums as well allowed you to expand your own storytelling abilities? Uh, basically, any idea I get, I can figure out where it fits and, and do it. Nothing comes up where I'm like, oh, I only write, you know, middle grade romance, and that's a big bloody horror gross thing. You know, I, I can find a place for anything, but it, it just makes you very nimble, which I feel like is a, a real benefit in the career as, as a creative where you can't get knocked down. Like kind of anything you do, you can find a place for it. Um, you know, anything feels at home. Everything feels like playing versus something feeling like, oh, I don't know how to do that. That's scary. But this general, it, it's just, it's like, I don't keep saying dancing, but that's how I think of it. It's, it's like boxing without hitting anyone where you're just always, always moving. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how, I think I would get real bored if, if I was only writing in one thing. I, I don't like being bored. Mm -hmm. Chuck, anything to add to that? No, she nailed it. <laughs> Agreed, 100%. <laughs> All right, so next question, Chuck, I'll ask this one to you. Uh, you use a pen name whenever you, you go between genres. What's the, the pros and the cons of using a pen name? Should everybody use a pen name if they're gonna write in different genres? No, oh, I, ha I have no pen name. I've tried. Oh. I keep trying to write in a pen name. Every time I like do middle grade or young adult, I'm like, so it's time, right? I'm like, I time to pull up my scroll of potential pen names. And uh, they're like, no, it's just you. It's just your, your name, your, your big, dumb, weird name on a book. <laughs> and uh, that's it. So I, yeah, I keep thinking about doing it because I think it'd be cool. And I'm like, I could create a whole website, like a mythology around this other person. It'll be exciting. And my agent's like, let's not do that. That sounds like work. I'm like, uh, okay. So we don't. So Lila, I, maybe it was you that used a pen name thing. I, I have you, one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my first five or six books uh, were all with Simon and & Schuster um, and their pocket and Simon Pulse imprints. And so when I sold Wake of Vultures to Orbit, they wanted to see if they could make a name for me over there. Um, you know, they're, these are rivals and they don't want to pay into each other. And if you haven't established your name well enough on your, on your own, they're like, oh, let's, this is like, it's like a, it's like a do-over. It's basically like in a video game where you die and you get a new guy. Uh, when you start with a new name, you get um, a boost in PR, you get this uh, de debut stardust, basically, where, you know, the uh, the industry uh, magazines like take more of a closer look. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a reboot. And so I started with a different name over there, which we wanted it to be an open secret. Uh, Cause at the time I was kind of building momentum on Twitter and my name was getting out. So it was Lila Bowen is what I came up with. Cause if you holler Lila in a room, I'll look up. Uh, and then Bowen is an old family name. I really wanted to be Dick Manley and like have a fedora and like a beard and like show up to my first reading and like rip off my hat, be like, I fooled you. I'm a woman. And they were like, again, like that, dial it back a bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, the use of a pen name is whether you need to hide who you are for, you know, religious or work reasons, or if you need that reboot boost. Um, I know some people who have, you know, used three or four pen names and then one hits and that becomes their name. <laughs> and then later on you learn, you know, their real name when you're at the bar and you're like, oh, I had no idea. Um, but you don't have to use a pen name. Um, but at the same time, if you're writing like, you know, erotic gonzo horror and then like picture books you're probably going to need something like that so it's it's a personal decision but there's no hard or fast rules no one is ever going to like force you at gunpoint to take on a pen name or use your own name uh next question chuck i'll pose this one to you do you work on multiple projects at once and if so how do you go about doing that i don't as much anymore i mean I mean, I guess in this technical sense, I do because there's always like sort of the thing I'm writing and then there's other projects kind of moving in different directions, either in a sort of a 
you know, Genesis phase or like I'm doing maybe some outlines or, or such. Uh, and back when I was doing comics work, I could write a book in the morning and write a comic in the afternoon because they were just sort of allowing different, you know, go back to the lane metaphor. Like I could drive on two different lanes uh, in the same day without feeling like it was a, a little too chaotic. Um, but I can't write two books at the same time I've tried. And I, I, you know, I'll like start crossing characters ever. As I said, yesterday I found myself in my pantry and I needed to go to the freezer, but I forgot why I was in the pantry and I didn't need to be there. So I definitely can't write two books at the same time if I can't figure out where my food is. <laughs> Delilah, what about you? Do you work on two things at the same time? Well, I'm a little doobie, so whatever somebody is waiting on from me and whatever they need, uh, whatever's on deadline next, I get that out of the way. Like, I feel like I need to clear off my plate before I can move on to anything. So, you know, in the terms of like, do I start one book and then not do anything until that book is in print? Like, no, I do all sorts of stuff. It's like, well, I'll finish this edit and I'll turn that in. And then this person's waiting on an outline, so I'll send out that outline and then turn that in. Well, then I can get back to writing my big book. And, you know, if I'm on page 60 and I get a thing where I have to do first pass pages, which is like the, the actual copy edit for your last time for your book, or, you know, if I need to do um, an edit on something, um, I would rather, like, I, I write a book, first draft, front to back, fast, furious, stupid, I don't eat very well, my sleep suffers. It's, it's, like, it's like Mad Max. It's like a race. It's so much fun. Straight downhill skiing. And so I don't want to get interrupted in that, but at the same time, I can't enjoy that downhill barouche if somebody is like, um, yeah, we needed that edit on Wednesday. So I do whatever's on my plate. Um, the only time I've ever been able to first draft two things simultaneously was when I was writing The Tales of Pell with Kevin Hearn, um, because we took turns with chapters. So whatever I was doing, when he sent me a chapter, I could read his chapter and then write my chapter and send it back in a day. Uh, and it wasn't that much of an impediment because there's literally nothing else on earth like the satire fantasy world of puns and pills. So that, that's the only time. <laughs> By the way, uh, bats, you have bats in your ears. I didn't notice that. They're great. It's my <laughs> Halloween bats. Good bats. So we're getting a few questions here just about your, your daily writing routine. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. Chuck, we'll start with you. Are, are you a routine person? Do you write best between certain hours or do you just kind of go with it and see when you're... I, uh, I, I kill the goat first and I sacrifice it in the circle, just like I do every morning, the black, the black goat of writing. Chuck no, I... He uh, doesn't sacrifice goats. You don't sacrifice goats. Please don't email me about this. Don't use that against us. I love goats very much. I would never do that. Um, seriously, my sister has goats and they're adorable. Uh, no, I don't know. I used to have a routine. So I, um, uh, I've come around to the idea that we tell ourselves as writers sort of mythology about how we get it done. Like we do that with writing advice in general, right? You're like, well, what you need to do, but in chair and you write this and do that. Uh, and we sort of codify our, our writing advice, but we also codify like the advice that we tell ourselves as to how we do a thing. Uh, and then I'm routinely reminded anytime I write a book that I don't actually know how to write a book. And, uh, the, the, the mythology that I've lied, the folklore I tell about my own process is usually a, just a huge, it's just a lie. And, uh, so I kind of relearn it and redo it every time. And Wanderers is the book that really divested me of the idea that I know what I'm doing. And because every day was different. I mean, like I would try to do the thing where I would get up in the morning and I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write my, my 2000 words and get that done. And some days it'd be like 500 words and the next day would be 5,000 words. And then I wouldn't write for three days because I had to sort of think on a problem. And then I would, it was just came in these weird fits and starts. And um, I didn't have, it wasn't that like tight for the pacing that I was used to. And it was very much a different book. And I mean, ideally, I think it's one of my better, if not my best book, but I didn't know what I was doing when I was doing it. So I've, I've kind of embraced that a little bit going forward that I try not to be too sure about how I do things. So my process is generally get up in the morning, come out and write until I'm done. And whatever that means, that means. Delilah, what about you? I used to have a process. I, I used to have a great process. My, my husband would go to work, my kids would get on the bus and I would just write my heart out and now we're living in a pandemic and everyone's home all the time. <laughs> yeah, we're all trapped in Zoom. We never leave here. We live yeah, here. No, and now I, I used to have an office that was outside where you had to like, I, I couldn't hear you. If, some, if the whole house was being ax murdered, I wouldn't have heard them. It was delightful. And now my room, I'm in like this glass cage so I can hear everything. So my, my process has become, you know, when my son is really focused on school from like 10 to 2, that's where I'm getting most of my writing done. 
Um, but I, I'm one of those people that I used to think you could tell people the button share process thing. Now it's like, whatever gets the book written is your process. I started writing when I had, because my nine-year-old, or nine-year-old, excuse me, nine-month-old wouldn't sleep. Uh, and so I did, I wrote my first book at like two in the morning with a baby on a boppy, like leaning over the baby, typing over his head. Um, whatever you can get done, whatever, whatever works it, I would wake up an hour early, stay up an hour late, ask my husband to take the kids to target, um, anything. Uh, but that, that time is sacrosanct. And even now, like there's times if I can get something done, I'll go to a hotel for two days by myself. Uh, because it's it's worth it. Um, this is it's it's tied in with my my mental health and my financial needs. So I'm definitely a big proponent of like uh, if you aren't getting what you need, step back, look at what you need, and get it come hell or high water. Mm -hmm. So last audience question. This always works its way into the questions, and I have to ask it. It's it's off. Is this the one about the giant duck or the bunch of small horses? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> a classic Reddit question. It's it's much simpler than that. Uh, We'll start with you, Chuck. What's, what's, what's your favorite writing snack? Do you eat something that helps you write better? Uh, well, it's a pandemic, so it's like whiskey and candy bars. Um, it's, not, it's not a good thing. It's not a good situation here. I'm just going to be really honest with you, Josh. No, um, I, don't, I actually don't snack. I don't bring any food out to the shed, um, in part because I know I'll get ants. And when I was writing my ant book invasive, <laughs> I had ants. <laughs> Uh, and not even because I was eating, just because I, I was it, there was a tree next to it, and it would rain ants on the shed, and then they would come in the shed, and they would run across my hands as I was writing a book about ants. So and that's um, where ideas come from. That's where ideas come from. It does actually it, the ant tree. The ant tree. The ant tree. You just <laughs> gotta shake the old ant tree, and that's where the ideas come from. Um, yeah. So I don't. I don't generally eat while I'm writing. If I'm really like doing like a hardcore, like I got to sit down and write a five thousand word day or something like that, I'll I'll try to be smart and bring protein type snacks up, beef jerky or, or uh, mixed nuts. Um, and not just like tub of ice cream time to write. Cause that's like, that's nap time food. That gets the keyboard all sticky. It does get the keyboard all sticky. Yeah. <laughs> Delilah, what about you? Um, when I was younger and before my autoimmune disease really kicked in good, um, I couldn't edit unless I had a little bowl of candy. Um, you know, it was always seasonal. It was like the candy corn or little Valentine's hearts or the, you know, jelly beans at Easter. Um, that's, I have many fun memories of, you know, frenetically editing, editing a book while bird pecking at candy, but now I'm old and my joints hurt. <laughs> so uh, when I'm first drafting, I forget everything. When I'm editing, uh, it's, it's again, like this Mad Max storm. So when I'm doing that, I will, like Chuck said, I'll buy uh, like charcuterie goods to make myself a charcuterie plate that requires no cooking, cleaning, cutting. So two or three different cheeses, um, a variety of raw mixed nuts. I'll cut up an apple or a pear, um, get some little turkey pepperonis on there. But that's, that's my favorite kind of, if I'm big into the writing, cause like that's, you put that on a paper plate, you don't have to wash anything. <laughs> By the way, my next pen name is now Turkey Pepperoni. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good name, Turkey, but it's fun to say. <laughs> so I, I want to get one last question in here before we go. Uh, just party, I know writing advice can be so finicky, but it, people I mean, you can hear us. We're very finicky. <laughs> very finicky. <laughs> We're like, do whatever. Avoid the ants. Kill the it's chaos. Chaos reigns. Dead body. <laughs> Frankenstein's. For people that do want to branch into different genres, different mediums, what's your best advice to them? If you just maybe a one sentence bit of advice to them on how to set themselves up to be able to do that. Uh, let's start with you, Chuck. Uh, if you're, I mean, really trying to if you're branching out in other mediums, uh, scripts or comic scripts like that is really a learning curve because you've got to read a lot and practice a lot and um, be expecting to fail a lot. If it's genre, um, I mean, obviously there's still the component of please be read in that uh, genre or age range you're writing in. And new stuff, not not even necessarily the old stuff, definitely the new stuff. Uh, and then just do it. Like, it's such a, a terrible, but you just got to do it. Do it and finish it. Delilah, mm -hmm. how about you? Yeah, that's, that's the biggest one. I mean, ideas are marvelous, but if you can't take it all the way home, finish with a bang, edit it, polish it, and move it on. Um, I, I queried early, I think. Whenever I queried, um, I, I did not do that. You know, I didn't hold on to a draft for a year. Like, I ever see somebody say, like, oh, I've been working on this edit for six months. I'm like, my God, why? Like, do you, get it out the door. Like, you're going to learn so much more from getting that book out 
squaring it, seeing where it goes, writing the next book. Like you don't learn, if you're working on a book for longer than a year, I personally, I don't think you're learning very much or you're leveling up much. I think you're probably polishing the brass on the Titanic before it's even gone out to sale. Uh, so like, get it out there, get it done, get it moving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, follow your heart. Anytime I've chased, uh, chased trends or written to a genre, that book has gotten trunked. And anytime I've gone, this is so crazy. I don't know if I'm good enough to write this. I don't even know how we would sell this. I don't even know what genre this is. Those are the books that have sold and gotten awards and done Same. Well. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much for being here. This has been a great discussion. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So th this has been another episode of Inside Writing. Next week, we're going to be back with article writing. Same place, same time. We'll see you next time. Thank you again to Chuck and Delilah and have a great rest of your day. Bye.